Hello and welcome to another episode of Talking Elections and COVID-19, a video series from the MIT Election Data and Science Lab. In each episode, we will feature insights from election experts around the country on a particular topic. Here to introduce today's topic and our VIP panel is the lab's director, Charles Stewart. Thanks, Claire. It's a um, uh, we're happy today to um, take a look at voter education, which um, is a really an important topic, and it really I think doesn't get as enough, enough um, notice in the elections community. You know, there's a lot of information that voters need to know to vote and have their votes counted accurately, um, from registration deadlines, the documentations they might need to register, to location of polling places. Um, voter identification requirements and how to properly mark their ballots as they're counted. Um, and there's a special challenges in voting in the midst of COVID where things are changing so fast, especially in an emergency basis, sometimes um, within hours of the polls opening. So this is a really important um, issue to, um, to discuss um, right now. We're joined today um, um, by three guests. Um, we have a bonus guest, I guess we would say. Um, usually th there's been two, but today we have Veronica de Graffenreid, um, who's a special advisor for election administration at the Pennsylvania Department of State. And we have Mara Sutman, um, who's um, assistant professor at Connecticut College's Department of Government and International Relations. And then finally, Leah Mirabaki, assistant professor of American politics at Mississippi State. So why don't we start by taking a broad view and um, talking a little bit about the research that's um, being done in this space. Um, Leah and Mara, um, you've done a lot of research on voter education, especially in the work that state and local officials uh, do to interpret and implement um, voter education policies to make sure that voters are educated before uh, elections. So could just um, as a start, um, could you talk about the challenges that state and local officials face um, when they design and implement um, voter education efforts. Yeah, absolutely. I can I can take this one. So Leah and I's work is really interested uh, in mapping out what voter education looks like across the states, uh, and it's proven to be a pretty challenging endeavor in and of itself. Um, but there are a couple of things that we have noticed during our research and also just in our conversations that we've had with local election officials and state election officials. Um, I think the first thing that came to mind when I saw this question was issues with resources and a lack of resources for implementing high quality voter education plans. Uh, this is something that you know, we've seen in some of the state statutes that we look at, questions about whether mandates for voter education at the local level are funded, but it's also come up just in conversations that we've had with local election officials about dealing with unfunded mandates for voter education. I also think that uh, the centralization or lack thereof of authority over voter education within a given state uh, can also be a potential challenge. Um, states where localities have a lot of autonomy from state governments, here in Connecticut, that's the case, uh, can sort of make oversight uh, and implementing consistent voter education plans really difficult. Of course, some amount of flexibility is needed uh, because different jurisdictions have different needs, um, but sort of that, that uh, lack of centralization can be a potential challenge as well. And I think also, you know, looking at the scope of voter education across the United States for sort of assessing the quality of voter education as a whole, there's really a lack of consistency in what those policies look like and sort of having a baseline definition standard of voter education. So voters are going to experience a lot of variation in the types of education that they have access to depending on where they live. And of course, this isn't surprising given what we know about how decentralized election administration is in the United States, um, but it is something you know, that's worth noting if we think of voter education as something that every voter should have access to. Great, thanks a lot. And Leah, this one's probably gonna be for you. Um, mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, I'm sure there's exemplary efforts of voter education out there um, and things being done well. Can you talk about what you're seeing that you think um, others could and should emulate? Yeah, thank you, Charles. Um, great to be here. That's a great question. And just, you know, a disclaimer, what we know and what we report is most likely a small fraction of what is actually happening across the states and at the local level, because we cannot possibly know and, and collect all the information that necessary to make an assessment, right? But 
Um, and states don't really need to reinvent the wheel. We know that there's some things that work, and if done consistently, they can make a difference. Small things as a PSA announcement or printing an ad in the local newspaper or radio, those are standard things that we should expect localities are doing, but we're not really sure if they actually are done um, uniformly, mainly uh, because of what Mara talked about, uh, resources. Some exemplary things that we have observed is as, as a minimum intervention as sending information to voters before election day. That seems pretty intuitive, but it might not be. Um, of course, you might have to deal with issues with, you know, mail returning and deliverable, and that's starts a whole other chain of events. But uh, informing voters by mail, um, social media presence, we have seen there are some localities that have been very active on social media, and they're out in the community, and voters reach out to their local officials, so they respond. Now, um, there have been some initiatives uh, to include the community uh, broadly uh, defined, like local high schools and um, registered registration drives and other organizations. So states, I think Connecticut is one of the states that has this competition for high schools to do registration drives. So trying to bring the community along, I think that's a great um, example of how states can build these partnerships and local officials as well, because voters rely on their local elected officials and we know that from research, right? Voters trust their local election officials and they seek them uh, for information. So being out there, being proactive and reaching out to the community, we, we have found these small, um, small interventions are, have been very uh, fruitful. And um, being on the loop constantly because we have seen that there is there are some efforts to spread some misinformation or some inaccurate information regardless of the intentions. So local officials have to uh, find a way to be on top of it um, to kind of get control over the information flow because that, that appears to be the biggest challenge. So again, in terms of voter education, there are many things that can be done and the lack of definition is a challenge, but at the same time, states and localities have tools that they can use without thinking, you know, necessarily thinking outside the box that, oh, we have to find the strategy and the recipe to get everyone at the same time. And that, you know, that's easier said than done because voters need different things and they can be reached out in different ways. Thanks a lot. That's um, really good. Um, why don't we um, now turn to um, Veronica. And actually, I should have said this at the introduction. Um, um, I first encountered you in North Carolina, and um, you've moved north to bring um, 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 bring your um, your experience um, up to Pennsylvania. Right at the moment when um, things um, need a lot of experience and, and background, and um, so you're approaching this uh, with a lot of professional experience, but also with new eyes in a in a new jurisdiction. So um, so right as you arrive now, you're dealing with Pennsylvania. And um, um, there was a there was a primary scheduled for April that's now been moved to June, and so can you talk about um, the strategies um, that y'all have pursued to try to get important information out to voters about how things have changed um, in the midst of the fact that Pennsylvania voting um, modes were going to be changing anyway? Um, so please, yeah, um, absolutely. So um, there was historic legislation. Um, in Pennsylvania in 2019, it's one of the reasons why I came for a new challenge for myself uh, professionally. And they were doing just, they're going to be doing a lot of new things um, in this state. So voter outreach and education was very much on, you know, the minds of the staff here at the Pennsylvania Department of State. So, you know, in 2019, with that historic legislation, all registered Pennsylvania voters can now apply for a mail-in ballot um, without needing to have an excuse and they can vote from the comfort of their home. So that is new in the state for this year. Um, since this method of voting um, is new to Pennsylvania, this state was already very much engaged in a, a program and it was called hashtag ready to vote. So it, that was, it was a thing, it wasn't just an afterthought. And we were also helping to educate voters um, about new voting systems. So um, those things were already happening prior to the change of the primary. Now with the change of the primary date, certainly our outreach not only included um, educating voters about the new voting method, but also about letting voters know about you know, the date change. 
and then also what efforts counties would be taking to keep uh, voters and poll workers safe on election day um, in response to COVID-19. So voting by mail became even more critical uh, with respect to our outreach as it was the way that voters, if they felt uncomfortable um, about voting in person on election day, that's something that they could you know, go ahead and apply for a mail-in ballot and again, vote for the comfort of their home. So what did we do? <laughs> what did we do, you know, after, you know, the, the date change? And so, again, understanding that, you know, there's a dedicated outreach team here uh, with the Pennsylvania Department of State. Um, we meet weekly with other interdepartmental staff, and we discuss and strategize on our outreach efforts. So it's part of the business model so that we can quickly adapt as needed. And it makes us responsive certainly to our community. And so some of the things that we did specifically right after that, um, you know, the change of the primary date, um, the website, <laughs> because that is the place that most people, if they want to know what's happening, uh, they go to the website. And so we make sure that the website was updated and we've continued to update our website uh, throughout in order to focus on key election deadlines, right? Because, you know, this is the election business and we're governed by um, deadlines. So register to vote on time, request a ballot on time. Um, and now, because we're getting close to that primary date, uh, return your ballot by the deadline. Uh, we very quickly adapted our targeted media campaign. So that included TV and radio. Uh, we mailed uh, a postcard to Pennsylvania households, informing them about the new primary date and the option, certainly of voting by mail and how to apply online for this. Uh, social media is part of our campaign efforts. So for social media, uh, you've got to see it. We <laughs> created a really neat unboxing video. So if you have, um, you know, kids, you know exactly what that is, like open up the makeup or open up the, you know, the new you know, iPhone to see, you know, what that experience is. So we recorded that to help educate voters about what to expect when they get their ballot in the mail, you know, what's in the envelope, and then, of course, what to do with the materials in the envelope and how to return their ballot. And with it, you know, the effort of, like, do it correctly so it will be counted and send it in on time. Um, new to us department uh, kind of uh, webinars that we've been putting out um, kind of like this because we can no longer go in person and do presentations. Um, so <laughs> just a lot of things and of course leveraging the use of technology. Um, things have changed you know a little bit in recent years to when I first started in elections. So um, this state um, is you know developing methods of sending targeted emails to voters. Uh, so voters, when they uh, apply for um, either online voter registration or requesting their ballot, they can opt in to receive emails. But also, we inform voters by email to track that process, like, okay, we got your application, it's been processed, your ballot is in the mail, we got your ballot. And even now, because we're so close to the election, we're um, sending targeted emails to voters who have requested a ballot and who have not yet returned their ballot to let them know that we need for you to get your ballot back um, in time and that the deadline is coming up. Thanks. So that's um, that, that's very helpful. Um, so. Um, Y'all, I won't say I won't say y'all have been scrambling, but this has been quite a quite a run to um, um, communicate changes to voters. Um, um, if there's anything that we know, we know that that what the election date in November will be, and that's not going to change. And so at least we have a we have a um, a fixed deadline. But in, you know, a general election electorate is different oftentimes from the primary electorate, and I'm just curious. Um, and thinking ahead to um, education for November, what are you learning from this round that you think can be applied? What new and different sorts of things um, do you think um, get implemented in um, approaching um, the general election? Well, I mean, generally, we're going to continue to do what we've been doing. Doing. And again, part of that is just being adapting to change, um, certainly, certainly listening to the needs of our community and the counties. And so, you know, our strategy is to always be poised to uh, be nimble enough to, to quickly, you know, get information out uh, 
when the information is needed, almost like just in time, but, you know, being, um, you know, poised to do that pretty quickly. And so the fact that we have this outreach team, ready to vote team, um, is very much helpful, you know, with respect to that. Uh, but there are some specific things that we're, you know, going to be focusing on or refocusing on. Again, the new voting systems um, is key and important. And we will continue to educate voters about mail-in voting um, as well as the things that they can do to stay safe, you know, even throughout the general election year. So some new things that we're considering is maybe adding text messaging, perhaps after the primary. And we have begun to um, use trusted validators um, so that they can help get the message out. Um, and so that includes using um, election officials or athletes <laughs> or business uh, businesses um, to help expand on that vote, um, vote by mail effort. So... Yeah, so PA's, you know, new law, um, you know, allows for us to uh, continue to know that we have to continue to get information out because there's so many new things uh, that are in Pennsylvania's law um, for this year. And so we'll continue to do those efforts um, throughout 2020. Great. Um, so um, the last the last question I want to throw open to the, um, the three of you, and maybe I'll just start with Mara. Um, and, and that, that's to ask um, about um, the, the usefulness, the utility, um, the opportunities for the research community and the um, election administrator community to work together. Um, and so Mara, I, um, I'd be curious about your, your thoughts, about your experience in working with election administrators, about what the opportunities are there, um, and maybe even some, um, say, words of words of caution um, in, in, in pursuing these, um, the, um, these collaborations as well. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, I'll start by saying that I have been uh, in touch with the Pennsylvania Department of State, I think for the better part of a year now, um, just working on facilitating the development of a relationship. And, you know, we've just basically started with my offering insight about what the election sciences community tells us about the voter education interventions that are effective. And as I was listening to Veronica list all of the things that they're doing, in my head, I'm going, yes, 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 this is great, this is great. Uh, I, I happened to pull up a list of the different voter education and outreach activities that Leah and I have collected and are looking at. And there's so many of them that you have listed, Veronica. Um, and so I think even if we're not talking about conducting new research or conducting new data, I think that there is a value in researchers who have looked at the literature, have studied the literature, who have done the research in communicating to uh, local, state and local election officials, sort of, hey, here's, here's what works, here's, here's what uh, seems like it has an effect. And so it's so encouraging, Veronica, to see the work that you're doing. I do think that there are some possibilities uh, for post-primary, pre-general election for state and local election officials to work with researchers to assess their efforts. So Veronica, you guys are doing so much right now in Pennsylvania um, and it, you know, it would be worth doing some preliminary assessment. Um, of course, uh, like Charles said, um, with the understanding that primary electorates are very different from general, uh, general electorates. And so that would be sort of, I think, a word of caution that I would offer there. Um, but overall, I, I um, have you know, just from a researcher's perspective, it's really enlightening to speak with state and local election officials and to hear more about what's directly happening on the ground. And I feel like the collaboration uh, can be so mutually beneficial um, and also just beneficial in terms of more broadly supporting our democracy. Thanks. Um, Leah, your thoughts? Yes, so I can speak of, you know, my, my experience here in Mississippi and in Florida too. Um, Building a partnership with local election officials, um, that is key. And that, that has been based on my experience with a state, working in a state that has a more, uh, you know, bottom-up approach of managing elections. Um, so, yeah, the research opportunities and some local election officials have been very receptive and interested in working with uh, researchers and even, you know, my students get involved uh, and turning these opportunities into what could the localities do to increase awareness in the community. So publicize them or bringing election officials into the community to raise um, awareness on who my election officials are and what
what they do. Um, so that has been great. And we know that throughout the, the state, there are many researchers who are doing this, right? We're not the only ones. What we don't know is, you know, how much of this is happening. We only hear, you know, the stories that are published in research and in the news. The word of caution, similarly to as Mara was saying, is how can we find the best way to know what is happening across every jurisdiction within each state? And that, that is a major challenge, but it can also be an opportunity for researchers to come together, right? It cannot necessarily be a one individual researcher, you know, doing everything, right? So this brings opportunities for collaboration among researchers, but also to share ideas among local election officials and state officials as well. This is a great opportunity, as Veronica was saying, for others to see what are some of the best practices. And we haven't thought about that. This looks great. And we can, you know, they can share experiences and they can learn from each other. Um, so I think this is like Mara said, this is a great opportunity to do a trial run with the primaries and see how we can manage information flow before election day and also the voter flow on election day. Because as you noted, Charles, voters are going to choose to vote in different ways depending on what their state permits. So it's important for local officials to know how to manage the li lines, wait lines, it's a major research of yours. And so many, many opportunities. Great, and I'll, I'll give the last word to, to, to Veronica. You know, um, researchers can kind of get in the hair of, um, of election officials sometimes. You were reading uh, my mind. <laughs> <laughs> But you know, I mean, I mean there, um, but I imagine there there could be fruitful ways um, for these interactions to proceed. And I'm just curious um, what your thoughts would be on that. Yeah, that's exactly my thought. So there there are two kind of approaches to this, and so uh, certainly that was you know one of the things that I tried to do in, in North Carolina, and uh, certainly in here in Pennsylvania, working with staff here, it will be kind of the same thing. So the two approaches is like what we can do, not only as we're talking about voter outreach, but also just outreach. To, to anyone, to the media, and certainly to researchers. So I think it's so important that because elections, um, you know, we're civics and it should be transparent, it's so important to provide good data uh, so that researchers can have access to that, you know, so they don't have to dig for it, but also um, explain, you know, what the data means or what our processes are so that as you're doing research, even if you're not interacting with us directly and there's no collaboration, hopefully good researchers will, you know, know what they're researching on and make sure that they're thorough and accurate so that when they are looking at data, uh, they're doing it in a way that is that's truthful. Um, and so the second approach is collaboration. And so that I champion as well. I love collaborating. Can't always collaborate with every single research group. Elections uh, administrators get a lot of requests um, for collaboration and we just truly don't always have the time for that. Um, but when we do have time, just uh, being able to you know, look at it or have someone point us in the right direction. Sometimes we don't have the expertise for that or maybe sometimes the time. So being able to collaborate you know, with different researchers is helpful because it helps us know, you know, are we on the right track? So um, before we started um, videotaping this, before we began, I mentioned that here in Pennsylvania, 2016, 107,000 Pennsylvania voters participated with absentee by mail um, in the 2016 presidential primary. This year, 2020, over 1.6 million uh, Pennsylvania voters have requested. You know, we don't know yet how many um, have returned. It's certainly well over 107,000. So that's data, you know, that we would want to dig in and we would love to have, you know, researchers help us, you know, pinpoint what worked, what didn't work, when did you see the peaks? Um, certainly looking at, you know, post the pr uh, primary, um, how many of those voters perhaps, um, you know, chose not to return their ballot? Why did they go in person to vote? Uh, so those are the types of things that I think are in, important for us uh, because they may help tell a story that will drive better processes. And so that's the way I look at data research and analysis. And I enjoy the collaboration and partnership with responsible researchers. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Great coda there. Well, um, <laughs> thanks, Veronica, Mara, and Leah um, for joining us today. Um, this, is, this has been fun. So back to you, Claire. Yeah, thanks to you for watching. We'll have links in the description below if you're interested in learning more about any of our panelists' work. Um, if you'd like to know when the next video goes live, go ahead and subscribe to this channel and ring the little bell down below. 
If you have questions about the MIT Election Lab, COVID-19 and elections, just follow the links in the description box below. And until next time, stay safe out there.